Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation for, to this conference. I'm uh, very glad, delighted to uh, talk in honor of uh, Maxim Konsevich. And um, <clears throat> so I will talk about uh, interactions between two subjects, deformation quantization and the hard algebraic geometry. And for both of these subjects, of course, we all know the amazing influence of uh, Maxim's work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so maybe to start with, uh, let me uh, mention that this is a joint work with several collaborators, Tony Pantef, Michel Vaquier, and Gabriele Vezzosi, and more recently with Damien Kalak. And um, the main goal of this uh, talk is to give an overview of the construction of um, deformation quantization for what we call shifted symplectic or Poisson structures that will be explained in the talk a little bit later. And the, maybe I should mention immediately the important corollary uh, of this construction is the existence of a quantization or deformation quantization of bungee of X where a bungee of X is a cer certain moduli space of G bundles on X, but considered as um, a Dirac moduli space. So a big part of the talk will be concerned about defining this properly, or at least giving some ideas about what is this object. And uh, more importantly, the space X is going to be of arbitrary dimension. That's the purpose of introducing this shift here is to uh, take into account the fact that X can be of any dimension. So uh, some references, where well, maybe I can skip this slide very quickly. There is a paper where uh, these shifted symplectic structures are defined and studied. And there are two preprints where uh, most of the content of the, this talk here, uh, you will find some details about the, the content of this talk. And there is a work in progress about shifted Poisson structures that will contain the details of this talk, the full details. And uh, here in progress, I must admit I have lower standards than uh, Denis about what in progress means. Uh, we didn't start writing yet. Uh, <laughs> but it's in progress in the sense that we think the maths are done somehow, and we are very motivated to start writing, <laughs> of course. OK, so I will start by um, some overview of uh, deformation quantization for manifolds that uh, will be generalized later. So let me start with Fedos of quantization, or at least this is what people refer to Fedos of quantization. So I start with a smooth algebraic manifold, and omega is a symplectic form on X. Here, everything is going to be algebraic, so it's not even complex algebraic, it's algebraic over a field of characteristic zero. So I will never mention any uh, transcendent or analytic argument. Then based on, uh, of, um, on um, fundamental ideas of Fedosov, I think Petru Kavnikov and Kaledin uh, constructed a canonical quantization of uh, this pair X omega, where uh, this is realized as a formal deformation of the category of coherent or quasi-coherent shifts on X. And the two, uh, the, the two important properties of this uh, construction First, it's purely algebraic. So as I said, it doesn't refer to any analytical machinery or anything. It works over any field of characteristic zero. And uh, it also, it's based on a formal geometry, and in particular, the formal uh, Darbu lemma. We will see a little bit later that this is going to be an important piece of what I'm going to say today. And the strategy of the construction of this quantization may be to uh, I can explain it very quickly. Maybe Dima can correct me if I say something wrong. So first you start at the point X and you look at the quantization of the formal completion. So I take uh, this X hat here is the formal completion of my variety at little x. And I can uh, quantize this formal completion because the quantization here is realized as the category of modules over some vile algebra with respect to just the symplectic form on the tangent space. And then the important part of the work is to glue these local constructions. And for this, there is a tool which is called the Grothendieck connection. Well, at least I've seen 
that is this is called the Grothendieck connection. Maybe it has other other names, and uh, which is a it's a tool to be to say how these uh, families of formal completion varies when x varies in x, and to glue these uh, locally defined shift, locally defined categories, which are uh, modules over the Weyl algebras here. And uh, maybe an important uh, comment is that the Weyl algebras themselves do not glue, but the categories of modules do so. So there is uh, uh, something that you cannot really expect the existence in the algebraic setting, at least, the existence of a deformation quantization on the level of rings of functions, but only on the level of categories of modules. This will explain why uh, later, when I will try to generalize this, I'm always going to consider quantization as deformed categories and not just deformed algebras. There is another um, deformation quantization, which is the famous uh, Konsevich's uh, uh, deformation quantization of Poisson manifold. So now I start with a smooth algebraic variety, and I have an algebraic Poisson structure on X. And um, Konsevich proved that P can be used to uh, deform or canonically deform the category of quasi coherent sheaves on X. And again, this is a purely algebraic construction. And uh, it's based on the so-called formality theorem, which is like, it has a deep statement, which I don't claim to understand all the subtleties in this statement, and maybe I will avoid uh, referring to it in this talk. I will uh, mention some generalization, but which are some kind of easy generalization of this uh, theorem here. Okay, so our goal is to extend these two constructions uh, to the case where X is no longer a smooth scheme. So we want more general, more general objects. And uh, possibly it's going to be a very stacky object. So it's going to be like an orbifold, but where the points have uh, big stabilizers and these stabilizers can be non-locally constant, the dimension can jump and so on. So they are going to be very stacky thing. And they are also going to be very derived. So this is something I will explain in a minute meaning they are very far from being smooth uh, variety because they are very singular, but they come with some extra structure that looks like a non-reduced structure that makes them a little bit closer to be smooth schemes than what they look like. Another generalization is that this uh, uh, symplectic structure or Poisson structure uh, can be uh, shifted in a way that is going to define later, but the idea is that instead of having an isomorphism between the tangent sheaf and the cotangent sheaf of the variety X, I will have an isomorphism between the tangent complex, and because of this tacky here and of this derived here, this is now going to be a complex of vector spaces, or complex of sheaves of vector spaces. I will have an identification between the tangent complex and the cotangent complex with a shift here. And N can be any integer. We will see that it's related to the dimension when we will apply, apply this to uh, G bundles on a space, it has some relation with the dimension of the space. Okay, so what kind of examples we have in mind for X um, that motivates this work? Uh, first, the modular stack of local systems on spaces of arbitrary dimension. I think I already mentioned this at the very beginning. Um, so, of course, the emblematic example is local systems on the compact Riemann surfaces, but we want to extend this maybe to three-dimensional manifolds or dimension, uh, manifolds of higher dimensions. And already for compact Riemann surfaces, where the shift we will see is zero, uh, these spaces come already with some uh, interesting non-trivial derived and stacky structures that have to be taken into account. So, uh, even when the shift is trivial, say, uh, that is something uh, interesting. Another kind of example is um, the moduli stack of compact objects in a Calabi ODG category. So um, this has to be, this can be thought as a non commutative version of example one in some sense. So these uh, Calabi categories can be thought as a non commutative manifolds, and this moduli stack of compact objects as the moduli space of. Uh, points in these non-commutative manifolds in some sense. And finally, uh, there are also examples like BG. So G is a reductive group here, and BG is just the classifi classifying space of uh, G, say, considered as an algebraic stack. There is this path 
object, which is a moduli for perfect complexes. So it's a moduli of complexes of finite dimensional vector spaces up to quasi-isomorphisms. And uh, uh, we, we, we aim for having a quantization of this guy also. And um, like higher examples, like higher Erlangberg maclean spaces for V coming with a quadratic form, I mean, can be symmetric or anti-symmetric depending on the parity of N. This also provides examples where quantization can be, um, can be done. OK, so uh, to explain what uh, the, the main statement, I should start by uh, telling you something about Dirac schemes. So everything is over a field of characteristic 0. And uh, in algebraic geometry, the schemes are locally models on spec A for A being a commutative ring, or say a K algebra, because everything is over K. And uh, in derived algebraic geometry, uh, it's almost the same thing, except that the local models for uh, the derived schemes are given by spec A for A, a commutative DG algebra. And this can be defined as follows. So first, my commutative DG algebras are not positively graded. That's a convention. So they look like this. Nothing in positive degrees. That's a convention. And uh, there is a notation that I will use often. I think I realize now that I never use this notation later. So it's completely, uh, maybe pi naught, we will see. But that's a general convention you can find in literature. And then the spec A I was mentioning, so A is a DG algebra now. So A is of this form here. And spec A, by definition, it's a space, which is the spectrum of the first cohomology group, the H0 of this uh, thing. So A0 modulo the image of this guy. This is an algebra. I can take it. Uh, this is an affine scheme corresponding to this algebra. And on it, I have a, I have a sheaf. And now this is sheaf is a sheaf of DG algebras itself. It's not a sheaf of ring anymore, but this one is a sheaf of DG algebra. And it is defined as follows. So if I have U and open in this spec here, it's given by, say, a basis for open is given by the locus where a function f does not vanish. This function f, I can, it, it lives really in pi naught, but I can lift it to h0. And I can localize the DG algebra with respect to f. And I get a DG algebra. That's the value of uh, o, OA over this uh, open U. Now, uh, maybe you're going to tell me that this f here, there are some choices. I can uh, choose a different lift. This will, be, this will be only quasi isomorphic. So this shift here is not actually a shift on the space, but it's a shift well defined up to quasi isomorphism. Uh, you can construct it in many different ways. But uh, there are some issues about things not being. Uh, not be, you have to glue things up to quasi isomorphisms to make sense of this definition, really. OK, and uh, uh, global Dirac schemes are, are defined as, uh, well, naturally, it's the same way as we define uh, schemes, say. Uh, it's just uh, there are pairs, x of x, where x is a space. That's the underlying space of my uh, Dirac scheme. And Ox is a sheaf of commutative DG algebras on x. And the condition is that locally, it looks like a local model we just saw. So locally, it's equivalent to spec A for A or DG algebra. So that tells you what are um, these objects called Dirac schemes. Now, um, these Dirac schemes, unfortunately, form an infinity category. So um, that's one of the uh, homotopical uh, flavor of the subject, which is not something bad. It's something good. I mean. Even if you don't like infinity categories, it's something good, believe me. And, uh, but the, the, the nice thing is that if, if really you look at this theory from the point of view of infinity category theory, Dirac schemes behave very much like schemes. So uh, it's the, the usual yoga of uh, algebraic geometry of schemes extends to um, uh, Dirac schemes as soon as this infinity categorical uh, nature here is taken into account correctly. So for instance, we can define fiber products. So in the same way that we have fiber product of schemes, we have fiber product of Dirac schemes. Dirac schemes have Dirac categories. So if I have a Dirac scheme, I can talk about quasi coherent sheaves on it, which are essentially sheaves of DG modules over this sheaf of DG algebras and so on. I have etals, smooth, flat maps. 
This is just a sample of examples. And one important thing, they, they have cotangent complexes, um, which is the correct analog in the setting of Dirac schemes of sheaves of one forms or cotangent sheaf of uh, smooth varieties. Uh, we will use heavily this thing in a minute. All right. So two important facts. I just mentioned them, but let me uh, be a little bit more precise. A Dirac scheme has a Dirac category. Again, it's an infinity category, but let's just use the word category here. So it's a Dirac category DQ core of X. Uh, it's defined locally. So DQ core of spec A is just the Dirac category of ADG modules. And then globally, you have to glue these local categories. So one way is to talk about sheaves of OXDG modules that locally satisfy some conditions, or there is a gluing procedure by just integrating these local constrictions over affine open subsets in X. And another important object is uh, um, the cotangent complex. So a Dirac scheme has a cotangent complex, which is an object in this Dirac category. And you have to think of it as the cotangent sheaf of X. But it's really a complex in the sense where cotangent complex is a bit misleading because it's a DG module. So there is an underlying complex of sheaves uh, behind this object here. And uh, you can define it locally on uh, one of these affine models. This is just given by Quillen's cotangent complex of the DG algebra A, which is an object here. It's an A DG module. So uh, concretely, take a DG algebra, maybe make it quasi-free up to quasi-isomorphism, then compute Keller one forms on this DG algebra, and that's a DG module, and this is a model for this LA, and work a little bit to prove that this can be done globally on X. Sorry, so are we going to stay in characteristic zero? Characteristic zero. Oh, great. Okay. So, yeah. I didn't say that? You did. I did. But I forgot. Everything is characteristic zero. Yeah. OK. Uh, so the rough schemes are nice, but the rough schemes are not really enough for what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to introduce the rough stacks now. So uh, it's a complicated definition that I will not give to you, but I will give an idea of what they are. There is a concrete approximation of what is a rough stacks. Oh, this concrete thing is uh, attributed to Gabriele. Huh? <laughs> OK. So Dirac algebraic stacks, by definition, or by approximation, if you want, are smooth groupoids in Dirac schemes. So what does this mean? It means I have a diagrams like this. So x0 here is a Dirac scheme. That's my uh, underlying space, if you want. And x0 is also a Dirac scheme, and I have two maps, source and target. I have an identity map from x0 to x1. So you want to think that x0 is the Dirac scheme of objects. x1 is the Dirac schemes of maps. And then you have a composition map from, uh, you know, if I get two maps that matches, that they match on X naught, then there is a third map, which is the composition, and et cetera, meaning a bunch of axioms I'm not going to write. If you want to make this correct, you have to talk about a Seagull groupoid kind of object, something like this. But uh, there is a way to, uh, as I said, it's a concrete approximation, just. Uh, Oh, and I forgot to, uh, I forgot to say something. Uh, I said smooth groupoids. So the con there is a condition is that these two maps are smooth maps. It's not written on this board, but this is important. And uh, so morally, uh, Dirac algebraic stacks are quotients of uh, Dirac schemes. So here I take the quotient of x naught by an action of a smooth groupoid. This is what it means. OK, so a large class of examples are given as follows. Uh, it's really a large class of examples in the sense that many derived algebraic stacks might not be of this form, but they have stratifications that are of this form. So uh, it generates a very large class of examples. These are quotient stacks of affines by a group G. So here, G is a reductive group acting on a commutative DG algebra. So this action, you can uh, make sense of it as saying that the DG algebra A lives inside the hub G. Yeah. I think uh, Sasha Goncharov already mentioned um, representations of a group inside the category of representations of another group. 
This is a little bit the same thing. I have a DG algebra inside the category of representations of G. And the corresponding groupoid, because I was telling you that you have stacks are groupoids, is the action groupoid. So this uh, spec A is X naught. The first map is the projection. The second map is the action. And uh, this form a groupoid because I can compose element in G. And the map in the other way is the identity map, and so on and so forth. And I will come back to this example to uh, explain what the Dirac category cotension complexes and so on. And this, this is a nice class of examples where everything is rather explicit. Okay. So the geometry of Dirac schemes, so I was telling you that the geometry of schemes extends to Dirac schemes, and the geometry of Dirac schemes extends to Dirac algebraic stacks in a non surprising, it's not very surprising, but for instance, we have Dirac categories. So if I have a Dirac algebraic stack, I do have a Dirac category of quasi cohen shifts on it. And I do have a cotangent complex. These are the two main ingredients in this talk that I will need. And uh, I will also mention the tangent complex, which is a dual to the cotangent complex. Okay? It's uh, the analog of the tangent shift. OK, so what's happening when I have one of these quotient stack? Here, everything is nice, and uh, it can be described purely algebraically. First, the Dirac category is just the Dirac category of G equivariant ADG modules. So A is a DG algebra inside Hub G, and I can take DG modules inside Hub G. And this, by definition, if I localize along quasi-isomorphism, defines me this equivariant Dirac category. And if this is defined correctly, it's always equivalent to this purely algebraic description here. Mm -hmm. okay? There is a definition of DQ co x in general that gives you back this. This is not a definition. It's a, it's a theorem, if you want. That's the test, exactly. And the cotangent complex is given by, I hope I didn't make a mistake here, because I always mix fibers and, whole fib and co fibers. I think it's OK. So I have the cotangent complex of the algebra A. This is the dual of the action. So little g is the Lie algebra of g. It acts by derivation on A. So I have a map from forms on A to these things, the dual of the Lie algebra tensor A. And I take the fiber in this category of equivariant DG module, I mean really the, co the cone, oh, the co-cone, the homotopy fiber of this map. And this is my object Lx inside here. So it's a. Oh, it's a very natural formula. I'm just saying I take the tangent space of spec A and I mod out by the Lie algebra of A. OK. Now, um, I will mention, just for applications, I will mention higher stacks. So there is a notion of derived algebraic higher stacks, uh, which is a mixture about what I just said, and higher algebraic stacks in the sense of Simpson, for instance. So you can, you can take quotients of quotients of quotients several times by taking actions of higher groupoids and uh, create even a larger class of Dirac stacks. And they are interesting because they allow you to treat some examples. Um, so for instance, they are needed to include uh, the following important examples uh, we have in mind. The first important example are shifted cotangent space. So um, suppose x. To start with, suppose x is a smooth manifold. This t star x is just a total cotangent space of x. Now I want to shift this. Then there is a formula. I can just take um, the symmetric algebra over the tangent complex with a shift by minus n. Oops. Don't you? Sure. Don't you want to shift? Uh, oh. Sorry. Functions on the yeah. cotangent so is the tangent. It's negative is actually a derived scheme. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is a, like a sheaf of DG algebras over X. It's not concentrated in negative degree, as I said. So uh, you have to be careful about what this spec means. But still, there is a way to make uh, to define this correctly, and that's by definition the shifted cotangent. And there will be important examples for us because they carry ca canonical shifted symplectic structures in the same way that cotangent spaces are. Uh, they have a canonical symplectic form. Okay? So these are uh, important basic examples to produce uh, symplectic, shifted symplectic uh, Dirac stacks. And you really need higher stacks because as soon as n is positive, 
uh, this is actually very stacky. It gets more and more stacky if n is, if x is a scheme, say, and n is 1, this is a 1 stack. But if n is 2, this is a 2 stack, and so on. So it's a linear stack over x, OK? And uh, it's interesting already when x is a smooth variety. So out of a smooth variety, you have a family of higher derived algebraic stacks which are non-trivial and meaningful just by taking this formula. So out of smooth variety, you create interesting examples like this. And the second other example, so it's the example here. So this was the first one, shifted cotangent. The other one is perf. Uh, that's the stack of perfect complexes. It's a classifying object for um, complexes with finite, with, uh, finite total cohomology. And uh, you want to take these complexes up to quasi-isomorphisms. And this is why it really is a higher algebraic stack and not only a, a one stack, say. Well, I won't say more about this, but uh, we think it's a rather fundamental example uh, to put in the game here. And you really need derived higher stacks to make sense of this. OK, the derived stack of perfect complexes. Ah, oh, surprise. Oh, and there is a slight generalization. This is the object in the derived category of K, the base field, say. I can also take a moduli of objects, say compact objects in a given nice enough DG category, and produce higher derived algebraic stacks this way. OK, so I'm uh, now formal localization. So I'm going now to explain uh, the, how this, um, so I mentioned this uh, Basut-Kavnikov, Kaledin's work, uh, where uh, you start by doing something formally at a point, and then you move the point, and you have to uh, glue all these formal completion together by means of this Grothendieck connection. So I'm going to explain how it works in this derived setting here. This is it's something I call formal localization, which is not maybe a very good uh, terminology. But uh, it means that we're going to look at the family of formal completion at each point and uh, glue these things uh, globally on the moduli space, I mean on x. But well, I want to do this in the setting of the hard algebraic stacks I just mentioned. OK, so why we do, we do this? We do this because of the non-vanishing of uh, local Durham cohomology in the algebraic setting. This is already true for a smooth algebraic variety. I can localize Zariski or et al locally as much as I can. I will never, uh, uh, I will never make the Durham cohomology zero locally uh, by looking at the Zariski or et al topology. And uh, this prevents for having like a Darbu lemma, because if you have something in Darbu form, the corresponding symplectic form is exact. So uh, if you have a symplectic form which locally is non-zero in H2, then you will never find a Darbu coordinate, and then you cannot apply the, the, the strategy saying, I have Darbu coordinate, I take the Weyl algebra, and so on. So uh, this is why we really use this formal localization, is because uh, we have to uh, localize more than just eta locally. And one way to do this is to localize formal locally for which the Durham cohomology vanishes. So that's the explanation why we do, we do this. <coughs> so this is what I was just saying. It prevents any Darbu type of statement for the risky or etal topology. Well, there is an exception here. I should mention uh, there is this. It's a little bit too early to mention this. But uh, well, n is strictly negative. I didn't introduce shifted symplectic structure. But when n is strictly negative and x is a scheme, Maybe it's also true for stacks in some sense. Uh, Joyce and collaborators actually proved that uh, the Zariski topology is enough to have Darbu coordinate locally. So there is something very specific to negative shifts where uh, forms are always zero in the Ham cohomology. OK, so the solution is the formal localization, and it goes as follows. So we're going to work at the formal level. So x is going to be a derived algebraic stack, little x a point in it. And this is going to be the formal completion of uh, this big X at little x. I'm going to explain how it is defined concretely uh, on the next slide. So why is this going to work? First, this formal completion satisfies that the RAM cohomology vanishes. Uh, the RAM cohomology here, well, I told you that there is a cotangent complex. You can continue the work and see that there is a Durham complex using this cotangent complex and define the Durham cohomology. 
and just prove that on a formal Dirac stack there is no cohomology because the Ram cohomology doesn't see the you know, nilpotent structure, so it just reduces to the base point. And then the second thing is that I've, I've, I will have to explain what, uh, how uh, this um, family of formal completion or individually each formal completion, if I make the point x moves in x, they can be glued to, rec to reconstruct the space x itself, or at least some invariants of the space x itself. And this glue here that we use is something called the Grothendieck connection I'm going to explain. Is the Grothendieck connection the same as the Fedosov connection? I don't know. I, I, I have the feeling that no. I have the feeling that, that Fedosov has this thing that he chooses a connection for some, it's not this? Or maybe it's the main connection, and from that he gets the infinite connection. Okay, Dima, where is Dima? No, no, no. Is it the same thing as Fedosov's connection? Yes and no. Yes and no. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes, it's a spaces, model of spaces, a particular real formal name. It's a formal name, yeah. Oh, this is. Ah, so it's so yes and no. It's what we call Fedosov's connection because yes. I think it's a This is what you thought as Fedosov's connection, okay. I apologize to call it Grothendieck connection. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, someone told me it's called the Grothendieck connection, but I've never seen any paper of Grothendieck where it is. It's paper about where he introduced Christian Gamow. It's there. Yeah, I mean, we will see why it's there. Okay. So it's the connection on, on if you want, it's the uh, connection on jets or something like this. Let me define it in a different language. So let me start with the Dirac algebraic, uh, possibly higher stack. And we define, I mean, I learned this definition from Simpson, uh, at least as a functor, I think that's his definition. Not, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it, it was called the formal group, the Durham groupoid by maybe uh, authors before him, but I think as a functor, at least I learned it from him, okay. So it's the functor X Durham that sends, okay, so a derived algebraic stack is a functor on DG algebras, in the same way that a scheme is a functor on algebras. And I define a new functor sending A to I kill the non the Dirac part, so I just keep the underlying algebra, if you want, and I take the reduced part of it, and I take the points of x with coefficient in this algebra. So it's a way to uh, identify in x all the points which are uh, infinitesimally closed. Okay, each time you have two points in x which are very you know closed from the infinitesimal point of view, or behave to the same uh, formal neighborhood, you just identify them. It's an actual higher stack? It's, it is an actual higher stack. It's no longer derived. It's no longer derived because of this formula. Right. Well, if you, if you apply this to BG, well, what do I say? No, it's no longer derived because it's actually etal over the base. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it, you have, it depends how you make sense of it, okay. Um, I had a comment and I forgot, okay. If it comes back, I will let you know. So it's a new non-algebraic, so it's not an algebraic stack anymore, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a Dirac stack. It's a functor on uh, commutative DG algebras. And it comes with a map from X to X to Ham, which is the quotient map. And you really want to, uh, I mean, Tony Pantef will give a lecture later this afternoon. I strongly encourage you to go there, of course. <laughs> uh, and he's going to tell us that uh, this X to Ham here is, the, is a space of, leaf, uh, of leaves for a certain notion of foliation. And here there is only a, a unique leaf, but now the space of leaf, uh, suppose you have a foliation, you want to identify infinitesimally the points along the same leaves, and this is what you get if you do this. So it's like, um, there, there is a general notion of foliations on derived stacks, uh, out of which this x uh, is the final or initial object. I mean, Tony will tell us about this later. Okay, so what are the fibers? So, so P is my projection from X to X to Ham. What is interesting are the fibers of these things. So the fibers are exactly the formal completion. So if I pick a point in X to Ham, so it's just a K point, just a point of my underlying, uh, of my stack X, just a K point. I take the fiber, I find a formal stack, which is the formal completion of X at X. If you don't know what's the formal completion, take this as a definition. It works perfectly fine. And uh, it's a little bit more general than this. I have a Cartesian square, 
where this is my projection two times, and this is the formal completion of the diagonal of x. So again, if you don't know what it is, take this as a definition, but what I mean here is that there is a general definition of formal completion of the diagonal, and that it, you can prove that it goes like this. It's a result tautology to prove this, but just by definition almost. Okay, out of which you recover this thing, because if you take a point in x, take the fiber, you will get the fiber of the formal completion of the diagonal, which is not the formal completion of at, at that point. So it's an interesting, this map here is interesting in the sense that it gives you the fibers of the form, it gives you a family of formal completions of x at all the points, and it lives over this x the ram, and the fact that it lives over this x the ram exactly tells you that it has a connection. So there is this uh, yoga here that objects like sheaves on x the ram are like sheaves with connection, so if I have an object over x the ram, you want to think of it as a connection of the corresponding family. So this diagram is the Grothendieck connection by definition. Just saying that I have, I have a fibration, I have a flat connection on it because it lives over x the ram. So this is my fibration. It has a flat connection because it comes from something over x the ram, and the fibers are these things. Okay, what's the, what is it good for? It's good for because of the following formula. Suppose I have a sheaf on x. It can be a quasi-coherent sheaf, but we will see it can be a sheaf of categories also. I can take global sections of x with coefficient in O, E, sorry, E, I should say. I apologize. And uh, because uh, global sections are compatible with direct images, because they are themselves direct images, this is the same thing as global sections of x to ram with coefficient in this pool push forward here. And the push forward is interesting because if I take the fiber of this push forward at a point there, I do get the value of the sheaf on the fiber, which is the formal completion. So this is something called, I mean, this is something like extremely classical uh, and uh, which says essentially that if you have uh, like a vector bundles on X, sections of that vector bundles are the same thing as flat sections of the bundles of jets in it, something like this. Did I say it correctly? You don't care, okay. <laughs> okay. A key observation. My shift E can be a shift of categories. So uh, I can look at uh, u goes to dq co of u as a sheaf of categories, which are linear uh, over x. So that's a sheaf of OX linear infinity categories over x. That's a tautological sheaf. It's like the, it's like the categorical structure sheaf. And then I, if I apply what was on the last slide, I do get that global sections, of course, is just the Dirac category of the total space. And I can write it like this global sections on x the ham with values in this special one. In other terms, objects in the Dirac categories are families of objects in the Dirac category of the formal, of the formal completions, which are flat for the Grothendieck connection. So to give an object in the Dirac category of x is the same thing as to give a family of objects over each of the formal completion in a way which is uh, flat with respect to the uh, Grothendieck connection. And uh, this is what we're going to use to obtain this quantization in a minute. We will actually deform each of these categories in a compatible way with the flat connection. So by this formula, I will deform this category here. Okay. Ah, let me state a theorem. I should have mentioned other, other uh, authors for this theorem, so I will do it orally. Let me state it first. Uh, X is again a derived algebraic stack. It can be a higher derived algebraic stack. It has to be with some mild condition, like locally of finite presentation. Then the statement says that there is a shift of uh, OX digitally algebra L, which lives on X, such that this uh, um, formal completion of the diagonal which is something that lives over X, is a formal spectrum of a certain sheaf of DG algebra. And uh, this sheaf of DG algebra is a chevalier complex of the Lie algebra L. So, well, it's a completed chevalier complex. Let me avoid uh, mentioning completion here. 
So it's just a symmetric algebra over the dual uh, sheaf of L, shifted by minus 1. And the differential here uh, is the sum of the cohomological differential and the Lie bracket that gives me a differential. And as such, this is a sheaf of DG algebra or commutative DG algebra on X. And the formal spectrum of that thing gives me back the completion of the diagonal. Um, so one comment. This L is the tangent complex of X with a shift. And the bracket is the idea class of the object X. So I should mention here uh, Mishai Kapranov for uh, this, for a proof of this statement when X is a smooth manifold. And uh, this theorem here of Benjamin Reignon is, a, is an extension of this to the case of uh, general derived algebraic stacks or derived algebraic n stacks. It's a way to control completely this formal completion of the diagonal just by a sheaf of DG Lee on X. Yes, so uh, on a technical note, when you say DG Lee, do you mean yeah. L infinity? Or? No, I mean DG Lee. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> I actually mean DG Lee. Yeah. Then, of course, you have to be careful about what. But the thing is, this L is going to be perfect, so the dual makes sense and so on. There is no strange thing happening. Uh, but if you want, I can also think of it as an L infinity algebra. Of course I can. So what you're saying is locally it's really nice. Yes. And then, and it's glued in some infinity category. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. OK. OK, the theorem lies a bit. Uh, let me come back. So I said that the, the formal completion of the diagonal is a formal spectrum. So it's like affined, uh, at least as a formal uh, stack. I'm lying a little bit. So, I mean, it's not Benjamin who is lying, OK? <laughs> it's my way of uh, stating his theorem. I'm doing some approximation here uh, because I'm avoiding to talk about the stacky phenomenon. So this formula is not quite true. You have to do something a little bit more complicated. But still, uh, it's, it's perfectly uh, uh, a good enough approximation for, to perform the quantization. So I will continue to oh. uh, think that this is true. Well, that's not true. This is true. It is true. The, this statement is not true. What is true yeah, right. is that it's good enough to do the quantization. Okay? So what is true is that quantizing this sheaf of algebras is enough to uh, quantizing the whole space. Okay. It was, it was just to be completely honest, but maybe I should have just avoid saying anything. It's true, for example, when, when, when x is a scheme or when x is a derived Dulin manifold stack, this is completely true. Um, OK, and uh, the, another way to interpret the statement is to say that the derived category of the formal completion as a category over x is actually uh, the category of modules over this uh, sheaf of algebras. And uh, as we know that this leaves over x the ram. I said that there is this Grothendi connection on the formal completion. These are functions on the formal completion, so the Grothendi connection extends. So this really leaves on x the ram. So there is a sheaf, it's a completed sheaf of commutative DG algebra, AL, on x the ram, whose uh, category of modules gives me back the Dirac category of x, because now if I take DQ of x, these are flat AL modules. And these are just AL modules on X the ham if I see that L, L lives here. OK, so what, uh, what, I, what I've constructed is a, it's, a sh it's a sheaf of commutative DG algebras, which is completed. It lives on X the ham, meaning it has a flat connection. And flat modules gives me back an uh, object in the Dirac category of X. There is a small uh, thing here to say that the L itself does not live on X the ham, okay? Because the L is the tangent complex and it's not flat a priori. So L itself does not descend to X the ham, but the Chevalier complex does. So, um, and this is related to the fact that uh, we need to deform the category and not the, the sheaf of functions and so on. Okay, so how do I perform uh, deformation quantization now? I'm going to deform this sheaf as a sheaf of algebra on x to ham. So um, 
let x be a Dirac algebra x stack, possibly higher, and then I fix an integer, and I give this definition. So a deformation quantization of level n on x is a formal deformation of the, its Dirac category, which is considered as an en monoidal infinity category. I will say what this means now. So it's not only a deformation of the category as we saw for deformation quantization of Poisson manifolds or symplectic manifolds at the very beginning, uh, for which this n was zero, but now I have this shift and then it means that I need to take into account the monoidal structure here together with some cert certain kind of symmetries on it. Okay, so uh, what en infinity category means? Well, it consists of an infinity category T with maps like this. So I have for any K, N can be negative. Yeah, Don't leave before, before I say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, there, is a, there is a trick that you won't like, but well, uh, okay. So uh, it's, it's a, it consists of maps where I have the space of configuration of K points in RN. And indicated this kind of uh, linear. It's linear, and these are linear functors, yeah. Can take it to be a DG category to be more careful. And uh, this is the, space, the configuration space of k point on i, and I have a map with inf two infinity functors, and this is the tensor product of t by itself. So it means I have a family of multilinear operations parameterized by the configuration space, okay, plus some you know associativity and uh, equations and so on. So if n is negative, of course this doesn't make sense anymore, and I use this trick. I hope you won't get mad at me. Uh, I'm going to do this. So E minus N deformation makes sense. So I will say that a, a, a quantization of level N is an E minus N deformation, but the parameter now has a degree, which is 2N. Sorry? Why N? Could be E, whatever you want. You know, I think in the next talk, I will give on the subject, you will ask the same question, I will give the same answer, I don't know. I mean, that's the natural thing to do. The, 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 what is behind here is that uh, EN monoidal uh, deformation over a parameter in degree zero or some degree is the same thing as EN plus one monoidal deformation, oh, sorry, EN plus two monoidal deformation with a parameter shifted by two on the left. Yeah, so just positive Yeah, it means that you remember the parity. It's exactly the same notion, but you need a uh, formality to make sense of this. Uh, that, is, that is something that it uses formality. It uses formality. I don't know how to make sense with that. OK, it's uh, OK, it makes OK. So uh, maybe it means that uh, brutally you two periodize the situation and remember just odd and even shifts. It means a little bit more. It's like semi-periodic somehow. Characteristic zero. Characteristic zero. Well, Characteristic zero. Can you make simplicial algebras instead of algebra? algebras? I can make simplicial algebras if you want. Yes. But, but then these symplectic structures, I don't know how they work. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, Dima knows how they work. OK. Uh, there is a small thing that this AL is not bounded. So I need really to take spectrum of simplicial gadgets. So. Just to double check. Negative here is the stackier situation, is that right? No, no, negative is the Dirac situation. On the, on the sheaf of algebra, negative is the Dirac situation and positive is the stacky situation. So this AL, you know, this LL goes a little bit on the positive side if you are in the stacky situation. Okay, so it is meaningful for all N. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, I. I'm not comfortable with this, but this is the only thing I know. There are two exceptions when n is minus one and minus two. There are things you can try to do, but when n is very negative, that's the only notion I know about. So, um, yeah, I apologize. And n is zero is kind of very special. It's actual deformation. It? It's very special and equals zero, and it's probably the hardest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Of course. Now there is a reason why it is the hardest. Okay, I will uh, say it. So what do I want to say? Deformation quotation two. So let's suppose I have a Dirac algebra X tax, possibly higher, and I have this DG Lee on it, and uh, I have this AL, it lives on X to ham. Now there's this lemma, which is not very hard to prove. Well, you need to work a little bit, maybe. Uh, that if I have a formal deformation of this sheaf of algebras, as 
something over x to han. As an n plus one algebra, huh? this defines me a deformation quantization of level n on this guy. So and no, it's a Lie algebra, but you want to kind of upgrade it to n, n plus one algebra. I yeah, I'm not deforming the Lie algebra. I'm deforming the Chevalier complex. I, the problem is that L doesn't live on x to han. Okay, ah. that's that's the problem. A L lives on x to han, but not L. Ah, okay. L is the tangent complex. Okay. Okay, so if I want to uh, construct the formation quantization of uh, x, I have to deform this LL as an EN plus one algebra. And again, with the same convention when n is negative with this shift thing. Uh, oh yeah, this is a comment that it's, it, it sounds like a, a stupid statement. It's not because of this uh, approximation I've made. Okay, uh, uh, this, this, is not this is not interesting. Oh, sorry? Why is AL an EN plus one algebra? AL is a commutative algebra, so it's, yeah, e, it's EN for any N, in okay. a canonical way. You use the Poisson bracket there. No, 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 it deforms this commutative. Yeah, exactly. I deform the commutative. I guessed, but Poisson then I thought bracket. maybe you were going to use the Poisson bracket. Later. Ah. The X is just a stack, there is no Poisson structure on it, so. Of course. Oh, not yet. Not yet, okay. I'm just saying that if I want to deform this guy, I just need to deform this algebra here. Okay, now assume that X has a symplectic structure of degree n. I'm not going to give the full definition, but let's say it's an identification of the tangent complex with the cotangent complex with a shift as objects in the Dirac category, plus some relatively non-trivial closeness structure. You have to say this is the underlying form, and you have to say it satisfies Dirac equals zero, and that's a bit messy, and you know you need higher homotopies and so on. So um, there are some, uh, well, that's the content of this uh, paper I was mentioning at the very beginning, where we give all the details about how to do this. So now, uh, I'm going fast here, but if you have such a symplectic structure, this sheaf LL, AL, carries a Poisson bracket of degree minus n, compatible with the algebra structure. And uh, the comment here is that this is a non-trivial statement. I mean, it, it, it's just a technical thing, but this is only an isomorphism in the Dirac category, which means that the form is non-degenerate only in cohomology, so it's only up to quasi-isomorphism. And it makes com a complication when you want to dualize it to a Poisson structure. So uh, this thing is really, uh, so that's the really in-progress part of this uh, very last preprint we were talking about. So we, we think now we have a full construction here, but it's, it's, it's not, it's complicated at the moment, so. Um, and there is a, I've, I've heard, I've heard that uh, Rosenblum and Getzgori and maybe Costello announced also another way to go from symplectic to Poisson, which is more global than the proof we have at the moment. So, um, okay, it's difficult, but it's somehow done, I think. But we also have in paper this accuracy paper. Yes. Small, uh, things about. Ah, there's a comment about that. Yeah, it's how to do it in DJ sense for DJ method. Ah, okay, okay, okay. And then uh, one upshot is that it only gives a weak Poisson structure on this uh, AL. And here I, I use the opportunity to mention this thing that this can actually be made into an actual Poisson structure of degree n. That is a work of Valerio Melani on this. Uh, that helps actually seeing this as a, Poisson, as a Poisson algebra with a Poisson bracket of degree minus n. It's an actual sheaf of Poisson algebra on uh, X to Okay, so um, now how do I do the deformation quantization? Suppose n is not zero, that's the easiest case. AL is a PN plus one algebra. PN plus one algebra is just what I meant. It's commutative plus a Poisson bracket of degree minus n. Commutative algebra plus a Poisson bracket of degree minus n, which is compatible with the product. So it's an EN plus one algebra because I can use formality here. So I can choose an equivalence between the EN plus one operad and the PN plus one operad, which is a theorem by Maxim Konsevich. And uh, I can see this PN plus one algebra as an EN plus one algebra, and I can look at it trivially as a deformation of the commutative underlying algebra. And uh, this gives me a deformation of L, so it gives me a quantization. When N equals zero, things are getting complicated because of course, E1 and P1 are not equivalent, but E1 
as a filtration whose associated graded is P1. And there is this famous uh, Kontsevich's formality theorem that tells us that deformations of E1 algebras and deformations of P1 algebras can be identified. But at the moment, uh, we don't know how to make this work on LA, AL, uh, due to the fact that it's DG and it goes in the wrong direction. So it goes in the positive direction. So I have the feeling that things should go through, but should be fine. OK, uh, this, is, this is a feeling for us. So maybe it's a theorem. OK. Still some technical problems to solve for us, at least, well, maybe. But it seems OK in the non-degenerate case, in the symplectic case, because uh, you can write down explicitly the quantization by some um, uh, vile algebra. Uh, but that de this depends on the Darbu lemma uh, that was passed to me by Kevin Costello several years ago. So there is a Darbu lemma in this setting that helps dealing with the non-degenerate case. And in general, this should be possible to do. So uh, n different from 0 or n equals 0 seems you know, OK. So let me state a theorem. Any derived algebraic stack, possibly higher, with a Poisson structure of degree n. Well, I didn't define Poisson structure of degree n. But I did tell you what symplectic means. Admits a canonical quantization of level n, up to some universal choice of equivalence between en plus 1 and pn plus 1. OK, so now how do I construct? Uh, I have two more slides, so it should get into the two more minutes. So let me uh, come back to this theorem. Now I want to apply this theorem. So I need, uh, uh, I need some statement to construct Poisson structures of degree n or symplectic structures of degree n. I need a machine to construct examples. And this is achieved by the following theorem, that if I have x and y two derived algebraic stacks, then there is a stack of maps. And if I assume that y, so let me see, y is symplectic of degree n, and x is oriented of dimension d. So like it behaves like a, a topological manifold oriented of dimension d. Then this mappy stack has a symplectic structure of degree n minus d. And you were mentioning AKSZ, that that's an algebraic version of this AKSZ formalism. And the other uh, thing is that BG for G reductive path, they both have natural symplectic structures of degree 2. For BG, there are some sli slight choice to do. And if you put one and two together, it gives you uh, you know, zones of examples. So the following Dirac algebraic stacks admit a quantization of level n, g local systems on the manifold, where I take log g on k, where k say is an oriented compact topological manifold of dimension d. Here n is two minus d. Bounded coherent shifts on Calabi-Aus. Like I can take the moduli space of bounded coherent shifts on Z, where Z is a Calabi variety of dimension D. Again, N is two, min two minus D here. So in part, in the first part, do you sort of use that it's a Poincaré duality space? Sure. You don't really need that it's a manifold. No, just that it satisfies Poincaré duality at a chain enough level. I mean, at a chain level and compatible with the multiplication in cohomology when you need some I don't know if Poincaré duality space is enough by definition. But. Okay. And flat bundles to state the last thing. Log, so log g the ram of z, so that's the moduli space of flat g bundles on a smooth and proper variety z of dimension d. So here n is 2 minus 2d, because the dualizing dimension of the ram cohomology is 2d here. OK, final comments. I want to uh, come back to uh, Sasha Goncharov's talk, where he mentioned this uh, quantum Hodge field theory. I think there are some uh, not understood yet relations between uh, his talk and the quantization of this log G de Ram. Because this log G de Ram of Z has an non Hodge structure by the work of Simpson, plus some thing which I don't think no one really wrote correctly at the moment. You have to include the stacky and the derived structure of the moduli space into this non abelian Hodge theory, which is not done yet, I think. Uh, and then this Hodge structure probably extends to the quantization in a sense where it's not clear how to make this, but I think you have a suggestion that there is a, an action of an infinitesimal group on it, on the category, say. 
And the reason why it should extend is that because the symplectic structure is compatible with the host structure, this is pretty obvious that the symplectic structure on this log G is compatible with the, you know, the, the, all the constructions, all the extra structure coming from non omega host theory. So that's closely related to what uh, Goncharov told us about quantum Hodge field theory, even though the relation is not clear. And uh, to finish, I should say that there are many questions remaining, like uh, we can ask for quantization of Lagrange and maps. Uh, there is a recent paper by Dima and co-authors. There is one about quantization of Lagrange submanifolds using, again, formal geometry. So uh, this probably can be adapted, or co-isotropic maps, as well as uh, you know, we have these maps with boundary conditions. There is a work of Damien Kalak that says that this theorem saying that maps has a symplectic structure extends to varieties with boundaries, and so on. And there are also some two special cases, n being minus 1, n being minus 2, for which uh, you can uh, find a refined quantization. And the case n being minus 1 is, seems extremely important for uh, DT, Donaldson, Thomas, and Variant. And that's the content of the work of Joyce and co-author these days. OK, thanks. Any questions? Well, then, let's thank the speaker again.